Good evening and welcome to NTD News. I'm Stephanie Cox. Here are today's top stories. Thousands of first responders across the country face losing their livelihoods if they don't get the shot. We hear from a group of first responders and Congress members on Capitol Hill today who say these mandates are about power, not health. More flight cancellations for American Airlines. Bad weather and staffing shortages have led to thousands of flights being cancelled in the last few days. We bring you more from hapless travelers and the COO of American. The Supreme Court heard three hours of arguments on the Texas abortion law today. There are also there are two lawsuits challenging the law, one by the Justice Department and one by abortion clinics. The gubernatorial vote in Virginia takes place tomorrow, and candidates of both parties are making a final push to rally voters in a tie-up race. And President Biden is going to announce a new climate initiative this week. He's promising to meet ambitious goals and take bold action at the Climate Summit in Scotland. As court cases over the vaccine mandates pile up, a group gathered on Capitol Hill today to speak out against vaccine mandates. Many tell us that the issue transcends political parties. Congressman Madison Cawthorn tells NTD that the mandates are about a broader effort to strip away individual freedoms. NTD's Melina Weiskup reports. Thousands of first responders across the country are facing losing their jobs for opposing the vaccine mandates. Here on Capitol Hill, a group of first responders stood alongside Congress members to explain exactly why they're opposing these mandates. I'm a cancer survivor. My daughter has had two open heart surgeries. I'm not just taking medical advice from any place. I'm going to take it from things that I've learned in my own life. I'm going to take it from my trusted doctors and I'm going to I'm going to use my faith. I, I'm not listening to random doctors, random scientists on TV. I, I'll fight to the end. I'm not going to I'm not going to lay down. She served in the D.C. Fire Department for 17 years alongside her husband. And with four kids to support, there's a lot on the line. But she, like many others, say mandating the shot is an overreach since they test before work every day. If you're providing a negative test before coming into work, you're of no threat to anyone. Even in our own department, people that ordinarily would have zero in common, politically speaking, we've come together to say that this is crossing a line and we're working together, standing shoulder to shoulder against the mandate. Some say mandates contradict science since it ignores the effectiveness of natural immunity. Fully vaccinated White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki tested positive for the CCP virus over the weekend. And we need to pray for her because she's now come down with COVID-19. And so it's becoming very, very clear that no matter what, if how many vaccines you get, how many booster shots you get, you are still liable to get the disease. It's, I believe people are starting to try and condition the American people to just take orders and do what they're told. Uh, but, you know, I, I think we come from a heritage of civil disobedience. And the, the government needs to be reminded that we work for them, not the other way around. Representative Cawthorn tells us it's a horrible crime against people who face losing their lifelong careers and retirement pensions for standing up to government control. I think we do need a vaccine. And the vaccine that we need is what's called the truth vaccine. Many speakers say they feel the mandates are about control, not health. And that's what they're trying to do, create a fear enough, fear in us saying that we're going to pit you against your livelihood scare you into thinking that you won't be able to provide for your family. These folks have chosen liberty. And when it comes to a fight like this, we will win. And right now, at least 19 states have sued President Biden over the vaccine mandates for federal workers and contract workers. And many of the people here are also involved in their own personal lawsuits. So for now, these mandates are for the most part in the court's hands, with many hopeful that the mandates will be reversed. Reporting in Washington, D.C., Melina Weiskup, NTD News. And the latest on court rulings. A federal judge has temporarily blocked an Illinois hospital system from putting workers with pending religious exemptions on unpaid leave. A group of employees recently filed suit arguing that the vaccine mandate forced them to choose between the vaccine and their jobs. A Chicago judge has sided with a police union, temporarily blocking the city from firing union cops who don't get the shot before the mayor's December 31st deadline. And New York City is experiencing its first full workday under the vaccine mandate for city employees. Many are refusing the shot, while others are protesting the mandate at their workplace. NTD's Arian Pazdar has more. 
City employees who didn't get the shot are not only unvaccinated, they're also on unpaid leave now. But last week, when they were still allowed to work, some of them protested. Some Department of Sanitation workers stopped picking up trash and around 2,000 firefighters called in sick. In order to cover for the missing manpower, sanitation workers will do 12-hour shifts instead of the usual eight hours and work on Sundays. And firefighters were moved to different areas to fill empty spots. According to Mayor Bill de Blasio, there have been no interruptions to city services. Uh, firehouses are open, no firehouse closed, response times normal with fire, EMS, NYPD. Set Department of Sanitation did a great job. They don't normally pick up trash on Sundays, but they did this Sunday. Some are concerned emergency services like the police and fire departments might have increased response times due to the lack of manpower. Congresswoman Nicole Maliatakis told NTD the mayor would be to blame if something happens because these services are understaffed. And I'll tell this to Mayor de Blasio, if someone dies as a result of your incompetence and your misguided government overreach, I'm going to be holding you personally responsible. She added that the city should allow for weekly testing again. But the mayor says the mandates are working. New York City announced the newest mandate just 10 days before it took effect. Within those 10 days, vaccination rates went up from 70 to 84 percent for the NYPD, from 58 to 77 percent for firefighters and from 62 to 83 percent at the Department of Sanitation. New York City employs almost 380,000 city workers. As of right now, around 9,000 are on unpaid leave. Another 12,000 are not vaccinated but are still working because they have pending medical or religious exemptions. The commissioner of New York City's fire department says they'll handle the lack of manpower. Union leaders have a different opinion, however. They say the impact could be tragic. Ariane Pastar, NTD News, New York. Thousands of U.S. flights were canceled over the weekend, and now American Airlines has canceled 250 more. The company says it's due to bad weather and staffing shortages. That's after a lot of employees left the airlines during the slump the industry faced because of the pandemic. NTD's Kevin Hogan has the story. Frustrated, stranded, but hopeful, thousands of U.S. travelers are not able to get to their destinations. It comes as major carrier American cancels another 250 flights on Monday. That's on top of about 2,000 flights over the weekend. I can't control it, so it's out of my control. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm sure it's terrible for a lot of people. They have places to be and family to be with, and uh, as do I. I have to go to work tomorrow, so... <laughs> For the best. It's annoying because it wasn't just American, it was Southwest a couple weeks ago. So, so yeah, they're canceling up until we have to stay here. So it's, it kind of leaves us stranded for a while. One major factor is the wind. Larger gusts last week slowed arrival rates at American's busy hub in Dallas-Fort Worth. American COO David Seymour told employees their staffing begins to run tight as crew members end up out of their regular flight sequences. The airline industry is very interdependent, leading to delays spreading as federal law prohibits pilots from flying too many hours. But staffing shortages are another big factor. Last year, American Airlines and others urged thousands of workers to retire early. That was when air travel hit a low during the pandemic. And now airlines are short-staffed as travel is recovering quickly. Some ask, what about the holidays? Cancellations are raising concerns as an expected busy holiday season approaches. The flight cancellations signal traveling this holiday season could be tricky. And the cancellations are sure to take a toll on Americans' bottom line. Southwest Airlines similarly canceled over 2,000 flights last month. The airline said it cost them $75 million. Though one thing the FAA and Southwest said is not causing the cancellations is the vaccine mandate. Nevertheless, the demand keeps rising. Except for some brief holiday weekend peaks, last week was the busiest week for airlines since the pandemic began. An American says it canceled some of its flights proactively so it could rebook passengers and minimize inconvenience. And it says issues should start being resolved by Monday. Kevin Hogan, NTD News. The Supreme Court is hearing arguments on the Texas abortion law starting today. 
Texas lawmakers who passed the bill gathered at the steps of the High Court to show their support for the bill. Let's take a look at what they and the justices have to say. The Justice Department and some abortion clinics filed two separate lawsuits against Texas over the law, which bans most abortions after six weeks. Some Supreme Court justices, including Justice Elena Kagan, were concerned about the implications of the law. Kagan was appointed by President Obama. Essentially, we would be inviting states, uh, all 50 of them, with respect to their unpreferred constitutional rights to try to nullify the law of, that this court has laid down as to the content of those rights. Uh, I mean, that was something that until this law came along, no state dreamed of doing. The Supreme Court had previously voted to allow the law to stand in September, but now they must decide two things. One, whether the federal government has the right to sue a state over a law like this one. And two, whether the law should be blocked. The attorney representing the abortion clinics seemed optimistic. We're pleased, obviously. Uh, several of the justices had concerns about the broad implications if a state is allowed to um, nullify a federal right through a scheme like Texas SB 8. Texas state agencies don't get to enforce this law. Instead, private citizens get to sue abortion providers that break the law, making it practically impossible for the clinics to operate. Texas Attorney General Paxton appeared before the high court to represent his state. And I'm also grateful that I live in a great state like Texas that really does care about life. And as you know, this bill does something that hasn't been done like this in Texas before, which is to recognize that life is protected when the heartbeat is first detected. Texas officials say they passed this law to protect the sanctity of life. And it was what Texans elected them to do. They are calling on the Supreme Court justices to also value life. Fate of unborn millions will now depend under God upon the courage and conduct of our Supreme Court. Both pro-life and pro-abortion groups showed up in front of the Supreme Court to rally for their causes. It's unclear when the high court will rule on the cases. President Biden is promising a new initiative today at the UN Climate Summit, also known as COP26. He says developed nations are to blame for climate problems and that they have an obligation to developing nations. NTD's Allison Lee has the latest from the Climate Summit. President Biden at the COP26 climate conference in Scotland said he will announce a new climate initiative in the next seven days. It will touch multiple industries and issues from agriculture to oil and gas to deforestation. We're planning for both short-term sprint to 2030 that will keep 1.5 degrees Celsius in reach and for a marathon that will take us, take us to the finish line and transform the largest economy in the world into a thriving, innovative, equitable and just clean energy engine of net zero for a net zero world. This new initiative will come on top of Biden's $1.75 trillion Build Back Better framework, which he already touted at the summit. My Build Back Better framework will make historic investments in clean energy, the most significant investment to deal with the climate crisis that any advanced nation has made ever. Also at the summit, Biden apologized for former President Trump's withdrawal from the Paris Accord, the first time Biden has done so since taking office. Biden then suggested that developed nations, including the U.S., not developing nations, are responsible for climate problems. Those of us who are responsible for much of the deforestation and all the problems we have so far have an overwhelming obligation to the nations who, in fact, were not there, have not done it, and we have to help much more than we have thus far. At the G20 summit in Italy over the weekend, Biden pushed energy producing countries, namely OPEC and its partners, to produce more fossil fuels while urging other countries to lower emissions. A reporter asked Biden whether it's ironic for him to urge both things. It does on the surface seem inconsistent, but it's not at all inconsistent in that no one has anticipated that this year we'd be in a position, or even next year, that we're not going to use any more oil or gas, that we're not going to be engaged in any fossil fuels. We're going to stop subsidizing those fossil fuels. We're going to make significant changes. Over 100 world leaders are meeting in Glasgow, Scotland, for the COP26 Climate Summit. The conference will be in session until November 12th.
Allison Lee, NTD News. Did the Biden administration break an important alliance between France and Australia? Nullifying the submarine deal between the two countries may indirectly benefit the Chinese regime, according to a French expert. NTD's David Vives has more from Paris. French President Emmanuel Macron on Sunday said that Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison lied to the French government over the cancellation of a submarine's contract. You have to respect uh, allies and partners, and it was not the case with this deal. And I think this is detrimental to and, the reputation of you your country to, and your family. The 30 billion euro contract was cancelled by the Australian government on September 15th in favour of a new pact between Australia, the United Kingdom and the United States, also known as AUKUS. The AUKUS Security Alliance would allow Australia to build nuclear-powered submarines for the first time with technology from the US. The scrapped deal with France would have provided Australia with 12 conventional submarines, which Morrison said no longer meet his country's needs. But the broken deal isn't just a financial loss for France. It could also mean the end of an alliance that would have lasted a decade between France and Australia against a mutual opponent, China. Editorialist Mathieu Sirvens says the U.S. move might prevent France from stepping up against Beijing. Economic losses are a big deal for France, but this contract also represented the starting point of a new strategic alliance against China. France remains humiliated and isolated, and I think the Chinese regime benefits from this broken deal. The French Minister of the Armed Forces said on October 12th that France has a role to play in the South China Sea including enforcing the rule of law against China's move in the region. Servants says the deal between France and Australia had a significant impact, as France would have shared military technology, which implies deep ties. Whereas President Biden's promises of selling nuclear submarines raises new concerns. U.S. and Australia cooperation was at the highest point it could reach, be it diplomatically, economically or militarily. The AUKUS alliance might only be an advertisement that came after the Afghan defeat for the U.S., but to transfer a civilian nuclear technology to a country that has no nuclear industry brings a lot of issues and challenges. One of these issues is the nuclear proliferation in the region. Last week, conservative candidates in the South Korea presidential primaries have called on the United States to redeploy tactical nuclear weapons in the Korea Peninsula. David Vives, NTD News, Paris. Coming up, jury selection for Kyle Rittenhouse's murder trial starts today. He's the teenager who brought a semi-automatic rifle to a Wisconsin protest and killed two protesters and injured a third during a confrontation. And over the weekend, a man throws a Molotov cocktail into a Brooklyn deli, which is soon engulfed in flames. A bystander takes action when he attempts to throw another. That and more here on NTD News. Kyle Rittenhouse is the teenager who shot and killed two men and injured another during last summer's protests in Wisconsin. His trial started today and jury selection is underway. He's facing several charges, including homicide and attempted homicide. NTD's Jason Perry has the story. Protests in Kenosha, Wisconsin began last year after a white police officer shot a black man, leaving him paralyzed. Kyle Rittenhouse, who is now 18 years old, went to these protests armed with an AR-15 semi-automatic rifle. During a confrontation, he shot three men, killing two and injuring another. Rittenhouse was charged with several crimes. Jury selection started today. Those who are picked for this jury will be in the front row seat to see exactly what happened and make a rational decision based on that. And anybody who is not on board with deciding strictly on the evidence needs to tell us that. Rittenhouse says he went to the Wisconsin protest to help protect businesses. Prosecutors are expected to argue that Rittenhouse was looking for violent conflict, while the defense is expected to say Rittenhouse was acting in self-defense. More than a dozen potential jurors have been excused from the trial. Lawyers on both sides are probing potential jurors for their political leanings and perceived biases. If convicted for first-degree intentional homicide, Rittenhouse could face life in prison. Jason Perry, NTD News. A man who threw a Molotov cocktail into a Brooklyn deli on Saturday morning has been arrested. 
He's charged with several crimes, including arson and assault. NTD's Jason Perry has the story. The man at the bottom of the screen lights a Molotov cocktail, quickly walks to the entrance, and throws it into this Brooklyn deli. One employee runs through the flames with his foot on fire and falls to the floor before escaping. And outside the deli, the man lights another Molotov cocktail, but a bystander knocks the flaming bottle out of his hand before he could throw it, lighting the sidewalk on fire. Then another employee jumps over the counter and escapes the burning store. Fortunately, both men were able to walk away with no life-threatening injuries. The New York City Fire Department was called and arrived on the scene within three minutes. The man who threw the Molotov cocktail escaped on foot and was later arrested. The 38-year-old suspect's name is Joel Mongol. He is charged with several crimes, including three counts of arson, two counts of assault, and criminal possession of a weapon. Jason Perry, NTD News. November 2nd is election day for state and local government. One county in Colorado is taking measures to ensure all votes are secure. Tuesday's off-year elections feature a host of local contests for mayor, city council, and school board in communities across the country. After the 2020 presidential election and claims of fraud, one city in Jefferson County, Colorado, intends to prove their system works and is secure. In the city of Golden, election officials are busy sorting thousands of mail ballots daily. So this is where we go out and collect ballots. We bring them back here to our secure facility, and we've got teams of bipartisan judges doing everything from opening those ballots to counting them. They say there are numerous safeguards in place to ensure that people casting mail ballots are who they say they are and only vote once. So our signature verification judges go through extensive training that includes an FBI handwriting expert who gives them uh, all they need to know about how to check signatures and make sure that they do match. And then we're regularly auditing our signature verification folks. In August, an alleged security breach in Mesa County caused a feud among Colorado voting officials. One day before the gubernatorial election in Virginia, the candidates of both parties are giving their final push to shore up support. Experts say the trend is toward Republican candidate Glenn Youngkin, though recent polls have showed the two candidates in a virtual tie. Monday, Republican candidate and former private equity executive Glenn Youngkin made his final push ahead of Tuesday's gubernatorial election in Virginia. And on day one, we are going to cut the cost of living in Virginia. It's too expensive to live here. We're going to reduce everybody's taxes. In addition to cutting taxes, Youngkin promised that on his first day in office, he would pray to God, increase charter schools, and remove critical race theory from the curriculum. His opponent, Democratic candidate and former Virginia Virginia Governor Terry McAuliffe released his campaign's closing digital ad on Monday. McAuliffe's strategy has been linking Youngkin to former President Donald Trump, calling his opponent a Trumpkin. Do you really want parents here sending your child to first grade where the teacher's not vaccinated, they're not wearing masks? No! Well, that's what you get with Glenn Trumpkin. That's what you're going to get. It's a tight race, and recent polls show the candidates in a virtual tie. However, an incident last Friday threw a wrench in McAuliffe's campaign. A political action committee called Lincoln Project sent actors posing as white supremacists to Glenn Youngkin's campaign rally in Charlottesville. Stuart Stevens, co-founder of the project, claimed on CNN that the stunt was meant to help the Democrats. No. Listen, every day uh, I hear people pleading with the Lincoln Project to help show Democrats how to win, how to play hardball. Um, you know, this is an example. The campaign trick received criticism across the political spectrum. No, that's not playing hard. That's misleading people. The whole Lincoln Project is a false flag operation. They're supposed to be Republicans who just can't stomach President Trump and his supporters, but they're really Democrats uh, who are intent on one-party rule in America. Elections expert John Fortier says it's definitely a negative story for the McAuliffe campaign and Democrats. You know, in a time where the, the election is closing up, it's not helpful for them to have a story, which also shows them you know, using sort of dirty tricks and, and having it backfire on them. In the weeks leading up to the election, polls showed Youngkin quickly gaining ground. Experts say there are two main reasons for this. One is that the low approval rate of President Biden has hurt McAuliffe's campaign. And the other is education policy, a factor that has gained Youngkin a lot of supporters. Relating to uh, the schools and everything that he's going to do with that, right to work. 
seems like he gives us so much hope. The focus on schools came after a controversial remark by McAuliffe. He said in a September debate that parents don't have a right to tell schools what to teach their children. The comment has sparked a storm of opposition in the southern state. The performance of schools during COVID, whether they're doing well, and also whether they are maybe moving too far left and becoming uh, too politically correct. And, and that, those messages for Glenn Rionkin are, are doing well, especially in northern Virginia, which is a heavily college-educated area. The governor's race in Virginia is widely seen as preview of next year's midterm elections. So even at the liberal Washington Post have said that if Glenn Youngkin even comes close in this Democratic state, that'll send a signal to Democrats all over the country that the Biden administration is seriously jeopardizing their chances to hold their seats. And if Youngkin wins... And if the Republicans get one or both houses, that's a political earthquake. Republicans won Virginia in every presidential election from 1968 to 2004. But the state shifted blue over the past decade. The Virginia GOP is hoping Youngkin will reverse that trend. In Houston, a new kind of professional is taking care of landscaping. The Department of Public Works is using goats to tackle the overgrowth. NTD's Chenny Wu has more. High weeds and grass are no match for these chompers. The Houston Department of Public Works is using 150 goats in a new pilot program to replace traditional mowing. The goats will be supervised 24-7 and grazed for up to 12 hours a day. Officials say this program has been successful in at least five other cities. It's very effective because as you can see they have it here only for a couple of days and there is very good portion of the pond that is already uh, getting lower in vegetation and they eat continuously. The program may also be saving lives. According to the NIH, there are roughly 85,000 lawn mowing accidents annually. Now we can leave the difficult terrains to the goats. This is heaven for them. They actually love to eat. If the city deems the program a success, we might just see more of these goats at work. Chenny Wu, NTD News. Just ahead, a couple of California Bay Area counties have new indoor masking rules. The counties say they're in place to ease some of their masking requirements for vaccinated people. And the San Francisco Festival concluded its sold out show over the weekend though the festival may have been giving city officials free tickets. More in just a moment here on NTD News. Hello, I'm Mike Lindell, inventor of MyPillow. Thanks to your support, you've helped make MyPillow become one of the fastest growing companies in America. Over the last 12 years, you've helped MyPillow create thousands of jobs right here in the USA. When I got my pillow, I'm asleep almost immediately. I stay asleep at night and I wake up more well rested in the morning. That's why I invented my pillow. My patented fill adjusts to your exact individual needs and helps keep your neck supported and aligned. I'm interrupting this commercial right now. Retailers have canceled my pillow. And to thank you for your support, I'm going to pass the savings directly on to you. For example, you get my six piece towel sets, regular $109.99, now only $44.98. Or my pillow dog beds for as low as $19.99 with your promo code. For the best night's sleep in the whole wide world, visit mypillow.com. In every country communism gains power, authoritarianism and death followed in its wake. Communism promises a world without suffering, and yet, in its execution, does the exact opposite. Following Lenin's death, Stalin's 29-year reign killed an estimated 60 to 66 million people. More famines and purges would occur. The very peasants that communism was supposed to benefit instead starved to death under its rule. The party dictates what is right and wrong. Mao ended up killing between 50 million and 70 million people. As an investigative journalist, I want to understand why.
Many California Bay Area counties have a new set of indoor masking rules. As of today, the counties are easing their indoor masking requirements to varying degrees. Here's NTD's Cynthia Kai with the details. Today, three of California's Bay Area counties are lifting some indoor masking requirements. Last month, on October 7th, eight Bay Area counties and the city of Berkeley adopted shared metrics for lifting indoor masking policies. Marin County recently announced that it has reached all of the requirements. Over 80 percent of the eligible population is vaccinated, moderate transmission rates for three weeks, and low hospitalization. As of today, masks are no longer required in Marin County's indoor public spaces. However, the counties of Contra Costa and Alameda are lifting indoor requirements for vaccinated individuals only. The two counties have not yet met all of the shared metrics. Contra Costa County reports low hospitalization but substantial transmission and a 73 percent vaccination rate. Alameda County has over 80 percent of its population vaccinated but reports high hospitalizations and substantial transmission. The two counties are asking businesses to check customers' vaccination status before allowing people to enter without masks. All three counties say businesses may choose to continue requiring face masks if they want. However, none of the counties' updated policies impact statewide mandates, which still require vaccinated and unvaccinated individuals to wear face coverings in schools, public transportation, health care facilities, prisons, and homeless shelters. Cynthia Kai, NTD News, California. The Outside Lands Festival concluded its annual music show in San Francisco's Golden Gate Park over the weekend. But it seems the show isn't quite over yet. The City Ethics Committee released a report saying the festival may have been using a department as a middleman to give tickets to city officials. We hear more from NTD's David Lamb. Outside Lands is a large music festival that draws in tens of thousands of people each year. Tickets can range from $165 to nearly $900 for the three-day event. It was canceled last year due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and attendees were required to show proof of vaccine or negative test results this year. The event brings in modern acts such as Nelly, Childish Gambino, and Lil Wayne. The performance caused controversy in the city government recently. In September, the San Francisco Ethics Commission reported that city officials received over 1,400 free tickets to Outside Lands Music Festival from 2015 to 2019. The tickets were valued at approximately $315,000. The Ethics Commission stated that this practice of gift-giving is problematic because in order to prevent preferential treatment, the festival organizer Another Planet Entertainment is restricted from giving free tickets to city officials but the city's recreation and park departments is able to. This is part of the commission's efforts to evaluate fair practices among organizations. The commission suggested new laws calling for more transparency and conduct on gift giving. The recreation and parks department did not respond to requests for comment. David Lamb, NTD News, California. Up next, virus cases are on the rise in China. Shanghai Disneyland tested every single visitor Sunday night after a person carrying the virus visited the park. Meanwhile, the Chinese Communist Party's headquarters in Beijing could be seeing an outbreak as well. And a train collision in the southern English city of Salisbury left over a dozen people injured. Investigators are looking into the cause. Find out more in just a moment here on NTD News. Shanghai Disneyland is now closed indefinitely as of Monday. That's due to a positive case discovered in the park over the weekend. Meanwhile, the virus may have even infiltrated the Chinese Communist Party's headquarters in Beijing. NTD's Evelyn Lee has more. Shanghai Disneyland virus tested all 33,000 of its visitors Sunday evening. That's after authorities discovered an individual carrying the Chinese Communist Party virus that causes COVID-19 had visited the park. For hours, tens of thousands of families were stuck inside the theme park. They weren't allowed to leave until negative test results came back. And the resort was also surrounded by virus prevention personnel. China follows what it calls a zero-case policy when it comes to its approach to handling the pandemic. That means that when just one confirmed case is found, everyone in the area will be put under strict quarantine or lockdown or made to get tested. 
Unlike China, many other countries have instead loosened their restrictions and don't employ such harsh measures. But in Shanghai, Disneyland is now closed until further notice. And Beijing just started the 100-day countdown to the Winter Olympics last week, but the pandemic is causing a lot of concern. The CCP virus might ha may have spread to the most important location in China, the area housing the central headquarters of the Chinese Communist Party, or Zhongnanhai in Beijing. And that's despite authorities' strict virus prevention and control measures. After new virus cases were reported in Beijing, authorities are implementing shutdowns and mandatory virus testing for locals. In the district where Zhongnanhai is located, all theaters are closed, and all performances and screenings are canceled. Meanwhile, close to Zhongnanhai, in the Forbidden City area, locals are lining up en masse for virus testing. Chinese state leaders, including Xi Jinping and other top CCP officials, carry out many of their administrative activities in Zhongnanhai. The term is often analogous with the CCP leadership, in the same sense that the term White House refers to the U.S. executive branch. A new U.S. intelligence report reveals new details about the government's stance on the pandemic. It says more intelligence agencies support the view of the pandemic beginning naturally than the possibility of it leaking from a lab. But due to a lack of key information, no theory can currently be proven. According to the report, if the virus did come from a lab, it was likely an accident that caused the leak. And that researchers in the Wuhan lab probably were not aware of its existence at the time. Earlier this year, the World Health Organization criticized Beijing for withholding key data collected in the early days of the pandemic in Wuhan. What's more, the new report says Beijing will likely continue blocking a global investigation into the virus's origin. In the conclusion of the report, U.S. intelligence agencies say they may never be able to identify the origins of COVID-19. And all across China, authorities are sealing off roads, locking down communities, and virus testing residents en masse. This as over a dozen provinces report new virus cases. NTD's Don Ma reports. China is pulling out all the stops to try to contain a fresh wave of virus outbreaks across the country. A spokesman for China's National Health Commission said on Saturday that 14 provinces, municipalities and regions confirmed new cases over the past week. According to state-owned broadcaster CCTV, thousands of tourists visiting China's Inner Mongolia region have been sent to hotels for two weeks of quarantine. Yijin Banner is one of the hardest-hit cities there. It's currently classified as a high-risk area. More than 2,000 tourists have been sent to a neighboring city for possible self-isolation, where nearly 20 hotels are being prepared for their arrival. The affected areas are also undergoing rounds of mass virus testing, and authorities are closing off roads. Those are some of the measures being taken in Henan province, Jiangxi province, and Hebei province. Video posted shows residents lining up for virus testing in the middle of the night and long lines of traffic as roads are blocked. In Yangshan, a county in China's Jiangxi province, authorities organized overnight mass testing after reporting just one new infection on Saturday. They aim to test all of the area's nearly 40,000 residents within two days. And in China's Heilongjiang province, the city of Harbin reported its first case in months on Saturday. That's according to state reports. The city has since imposed lockdown measures on all residential communities that the patient and their close contacts recently visited. Don Ma, NTD News. And over to Europe. Today, investigators are looking into what caused a train collision in the southern English city of Salisbury on Sunday. There have been no reports of fatalities, yet over a dozen people have been injured. This report from NTD's Kostamines. Two passenger trains crashed in the southern city of Salisbury on Sunday, leaving several people injured. Network Rail said the rear carriage of a passenger train derailed after striking an object. The derailment knocked out all of the signaling in the area, and a second train then collided with the derailed one. Some 50 firefighters rushed to the scene. Firefighters have carried out a thorough search of the train carriages and we've assisted with the evacuation of approximately 100 people. We do not believe there are any further casualties on board the train and we can confirm that there are no fatalities. Passengers described witnessing chaos and hearing sounds like thunder when the crash happened. I heard a lot of weird sounds and then I saw flames, so, so I sat back and I, I pressed against the table so I could feel more safe. 
I, said, I, I heard a lot of girls screaming and then boys shouting. And then, then when the train stopped, the lights went out. We saw another train on the left. I was just sitting in the first carriage and then a big, a big crash. I, I heard a big crash and then I saw the flames and I got pretty scared. Uh, after that, the lights went out and uh, the position of the train was uh, like 45 degrees tilted to the right. All passengers and a driver who was trapped in his cab were evacuated. Over a dozen people were taken to the hospital and most of them have been discharged by Monday. BBC reported the driver suffered injuries believed to be life-changing, but he's in a stable condition. The line remains closed for several days. Costa Menes, NTD News. Thousands of people marched through central London on Saturday, protesting against vaccine passports and the government's winter COVID Plan B. With vaccine passports already being rolled out in Wales and Scotland, many protesters were concerned about the loss of freedoms they may bring. NTD's Joy Duguid tells us more. Thousands of people marched in central London on Saturday to protest against the potential introduction of vaccine passports as part of the government's winter COVID Plan B. Protesters marched through Piccadilly Circus calling for medical freedom. Microbiologist Catherine Pritchard said she is against vaccine passports because they will restrain freedoms. As a microbiologist and a person who's been vaccinated many, many times and travelled all over the world having things like yellow fever, typhoid, hepatitis and whatever, I've taken all my jabs, but this jab is a bit different and I'm deeply concerned that it's been rolled out whilst it was in a trial phase and has been rolled out in such magnitude and to so many people, we haven't had a time to evaluate its efficacy and its safety. Pritchard is also concerned over the government's decision to give vaccines to healthy children, as the Joint Committee on Vaccination and Immunisation doesn't recommend this. The decision was based on depression caused by children missing school. Apparently the calculation was that children would save 15 minutes in school if they have that vaccine, and for that alone, that risk is too massive to have a jab to save you 15 minutes of extra schooling over the coming winter. Fifi is a member of an organisation called A Stand in the Park, started in Australia to celebrate freedom and fairness. We're marching for medical freedom specifically for this. Obviously, we've got the, the threat of vaccine passports being rolled out. We've seen them actually being rolled out um, in Wales now. So obviously, we're massively opposed to that. Wayne Peacher is from Norwich. He said he's joined similar protests before because he feels information is being controlled. Well, because the mainstream media is totally controlled, the public do not get to hear about the information. What they get are just fabrications, distortions and lies, basically. The protest was organised by the Together Declaration an alliance of more than 200 organisations, business groups, campaigners and professionals who are concerned about the introduction of vaccine passports. Joy Duguid, NTD News. Barclays boss Jess Staley has stepped down following an investigation into his ties with disgraced financier and convicted sex offender Jeffrey Epstein. Financial regulators have been investigating whether links between the two were closer than first thought. Early last year, Staley admitted they remained in contact several years after Epstein's conviction for sex offences with minors in 2008. NTD's Malcolm Hudson has this report. Barclays Chief Executive Jess Staley has quit after an investigation into his links with Jeffrey Epstein. Regulators have been probing whether the relationship between the Barclays boss and the convicted sex offender was closer than first thought. The Financial Conduct Authority and the Prudential Regulatory Authority began their investigation after getting a cache of emails between the two men from Staley's former employer. Epstein was a client at JP Morgan when Staley started working for the bank in 2000. The two maintained a relationship until Staley left in 2013, after which he says their relationship tapered off quite significantly. 
but Epstein was convicted of sex offences with minors in 2008, raising questions as to why Staley continued the relationship for several years. It is also known that Staley visited Epstein's private island in 2015, months before taking over as Barclays CEO. Barclays said, in light of the conclusions and Staley's intention to contest them, the board and Staley have agreed he will step down. Malcolm Hudson, NTD News, London. Australians are finally able to return home after a year and a half stranded abroad. The nation imposed some of the world's most stringent pandemic restrictions. Australia eased its international border restrictions on Monday for the first time since the pandemic, allowing some of its vaccinated public to travel freely and many families to reunite. And there were some emotional moments at Sydney's airport. It's a pretty emotional day today. Um, we lost my father-in-law last week, so uh, it's happy feelings and sad feelings all at the same time, but so glad to see our family finally. After 18 months of some of the world's strictest virus border policies, millions of Australians are now free to travel without a permit or the need to quarantine. It's great. It's um, so happy for the government that they decided to do this. I think it's a great decision in terms of opening everything up again. Travel is initially limited to Australian citizens, permanent residents, and their immediate families. But it's a step to reopening the country to international tourists and workers. A little bit scary and exciting. I've come home to see my mum because she's not well. So um, it's all anxious and excitement and I love her heaps and I can't wait to see her. Two years. Oh man. Yeah, it's been a long time. Passengers on the first flights from Singapore and Los Angeles arrived in Sydney early in the morning. Many were greeted by friends and relatives they had not seen for several months. And this is the relief of, we're finally here. It's been a long week, it's been a long 24 hours. We've been traveling for probably more than that now. Um, and just the relief of seeing them. Travelers were also welcomed by airline staff holding banners and were given Australian wildflowers and chocolate biscuits. The first word was an Australian accent. It's been so long since we've heard one. In one of the world's toughest responses to the pandemic, Australia closed its international border 18 months ago. Barring foreign tourists and banning citizens from either exiting or arriving unless granted an exemption. Andrew Thomas, NTD News. Coming up, there's more than meets the eye to an engineer at the Formula One headquarters in England. He seemingly peeled off his face and revealed himself to be a champion British race car driver. More soon on NTD News. You worked hard for your money. You invest in stability for your retirement and your family's future to build and leave them with something greater. The next unprecedented financial crisis, political misstep or unstable government can depreciate it all away. It was called the gold standard for a reason, the financial preservation of tomorrow. Diversify your assets against inflation, market volatility and the unknown with real money. Hedge your wealth with the purest form of money physical gold and silver. Because any currency printed on paper can be manipulated. What's backing up your IRA? Do what you need to do right now to be prepared with the Reagan Gold Group. Visit now rggusakit.com or call us at 866-912-1384. Receive up to $2,500 in free silver coins and a free safe with your new precious metals IRA. Call now. Ralph Lauren is looking for ways to draw customers back to stores by offering color on demand. That means in select stores, you may soon be able to walk in, choose a color, and have your shirt dyed in store right before you buy it. NTD's Faye Quarter has more. In its flagship stores in New York, Ralph Lauren plans to use new textile coloring technology to enable customers to dye their own polo shirts. Its business partner with the technology told CNBC, so far the details of the in-store dyeing process are unknown, but many people have high expectations. The color thing is, is actually a very good idea. Yeah, I would still buy the polo shirt because I just feel like Ralph Lauren, he's a big brand. Some New Yorkers are showing interest in the new in-store shopping experience Ralph Lauren is trying. 
I do like online shopping, but this sounds like they're working on something to get people back in the stores. And it sounds really interesting. If they were to dye uh, a, a color that I would want, that would make me come into the store, yes. Pandemic lockdowns hit brick and mortar stores hard, driving a boom in e-commerce. So what's the next step for physical stores? Retail analyst at BMO Capital Markets, Simon Siegel, told CNBC, the store will become more experiential each and every day. The trick is how to capitalize on it to sell more things. He emphasizes that experiential retail heavily relies on customization and rapid production. Ralph Lauren's new strategy is making the customer the creator. Siegel says, this has always been a powerful thing. Bringing the consumer into the story has always been a winning proposition. The new color dye system was first developed to help the company improve its environmental footprint. Ralph Lauren also hopes it will alleviate supply constraints with better balance inventory and more efficiently meet demand for their products, serving consumers exactly what they want. Faye Quarter, NTD News. Now that Halloween is over, Target is getting a jump start on Christmas. The retailer started its Black Friday sales Monday. Each week, it will offer holiday best deals, which are the best prices for the whole season. These sales include electronics, toys, kitchen appliances, apparel, and beauty. New deals are released each Sunday, and not all deals will last the whole week. Experts recommend shopping early this year because of shortages and supply chain issues. And in Northamptonshire, England, three kids were up for a surprise. An engineer at the Formula One headquarters took off his disguise and revealed himself to be British race car driver Lewis Hamilton. And TD's Jenny Wu has the story. We found three children that are passionate about engineering and motorsport, and we've invited them to the factory. Lewis they Hamilton was yet, disguised but... as a team engineer at Mercedes Formula One headquarters in England. The auto racing champion then surprised the children as he seemingly peeled off his face. Sorry, but I'm Lewis. Hamilton, working with UBS Bank in Mercedes, offered hand-selected children a chance to learn more about motorsport. He also gave them some advice. Keep believing in yourself, that's the most important thing, because no one else is going to do it for you. If I can do it, then you can 100% do it. And the three kids it, left in high spirits. Lewis said to never give up, always believe in yourself. An opportunity in a lifetime. The best thing that's happened to me in my whole life. Working with UBS, Chenny Wu, really NTD News. And that's all for today's news. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stephanie Cox.